hate snow. The way it silently descends from the sky. I hate how cold it is to the touch. I even hate the puddle it leaves behind when it melts. But most of all, I hate it because it reminds me of the night my husband was taken from me. It began with a power outage. I suddenly heard Dan shouting some of his trademark expletives from the adjacent room, muffled only by the thin wall dividing us. On the days that he was scheduled to work from home, we generally stayed out of each other's way, so I was still in bed and mindlessly flipping through some catalog when he came stomping down the corridor. For a man in his thirties, he sure acted like a toddler whenever something inconvenienced him, though it did make him easy to read, which I found myself appreciating. I begrudgingly abandoned the warm comfort of our bed and rolled onto my bare feet. Everything all right, babe? I called out while scanning the floor for my slippers, only to receive more incoherent ranting in response. I could hear him pacing outside the door until he eventually joined me in the bedroom. Before I had the chance to ask what was going on, he raised his finger toward me and then used those blue, albeit partially bloodshot eyes of his to gesture toward the phone still pressed into his ear. His tone switched from raving man-child to professional in an instant. Yes, of course. I understand, sir. I, I will. Thank you. Have a great weekend, sir. The distinctive sound of the call ending prompted Dan to breathe easy again. He wiped his face with his palm, released a groan toward the ceiling, and then looked down at me. Power's gone, he said, flicking the nearest light switch on and off as if I wouldn't have believed it otherwise. Boss says that I'll have to finish my shift at the office if it doesn't come back in a few hours. I frowned and turned toward the frost-glazed window. It was late in the afternoon, and the snowstorm from yesterday wasn't showing any sign of letting off. The backyard was completely buried underneath a pale blanket of snow. Only the heads of a few lawn ornaments still broke the surface. Needless to say, I wasn't too keen on letting Dan go out there. We contacted the utility company for our area. Though they acknowledged that there had indeed been an outage, they were unable to give us a time frame as to when it was going to be fixed. It was an unexpected response given the hazardous weather outside, but still no less discouraging. At least we know it's not the wiring this time, my husband said while digging through his section of our shared closet. Sweaters, scarves, jackets, and various other clothing items were being haphazardly strewn about, some of them I hadn't even seen him wearing since our college days, back when he used to take me skiing. Isn't forcing you to go out during a goddamn blizzard a health violation or something? You're exaggerating. Besides, if I don't, they'll just wait a week and find an excuse to fire me anyway. I can't afford that, especially now. I huffed and glanced down. My swollen belly was poking out from underneath the loose shirt that I'd slept in. I was eight months pregnant at the time. Being on paternity leave, I still got a paycheck at the end of each month, but I felt guilty that Dan was the only one actually working, especially since I've never been good housewife material. As he reached back and placed his large hand over my stomach, a familiar sense of ease washed over me. I smiled. I knew it was temporary, but I held on to that feeling for as long as it lasted. By 8 p.m., it became apparent that the power wasn't going to be coming back. I moved some of my blankets over to the living room and saw that Dan had graciously stoked the fireplace for me. In any other circumstance, him standing in the dim, ambient glow could have been perceived as somewhat enticing. Unfortunately, any such inclinations were offset by the prospect of his approaching departure. Should be back after midnight. Call me if you need anything, but try not to waste your battery, he said as he zipped up his jacket. Yeah, yeah, I know. Come here. We exchanged a brief kiss, and I waved him off in a display of feigned indifference. In reality, the thought of being left alone in a cold, dark and empty house unnerved me. I couldn't let him see that, 
the last thing I wanted was to give Dan even more reasons to worry about me. I threw a blanket over my shoulders and huddled closer to the crackling fire, seeing comfort in its warmth. The jingling of his keys resonated from the cramped entrance hall behind me, followed by the sound of the front door opening and closing. Having mentally prepared myself for an evening of quiet and solitude, imagine my surprise when Dan came storming back inside. I stood up just in time to witness his shadowy outline slamming the door shut and bracing against it. Babe? I meekly inquired. I used my phone as an improvised flashlight and pointed it directly at him, only to be taken back by the expression of horror that was plastered across his face. His eyes were nearly bulging out of their sockets and his mouth was hanging gape, frozen in a mute scream. He was trembling, but evidently it wasn't from the cold. Whatever stood beyond that door had traumatized him, broken him. Dan didn't react, even as I rushed by his side. I just kept staring onward. He didn't even blink. Getting him to budge was like trying to move a statue, not helped by the fact that he was about 90 pounds heavier than me. Daniel, this isn't funny. I hadn't called him by his first name in years. It felt wrong even coming out of my mouth, but I needed some way of conveying to him that he was seriously freaking me out. Some part of me held out a hope that it was all just a stupid act. I lightly tapped my palm against the scruffy cheek. Just tell me what's wrong, please. Nothing. Despite all my efforts, I ultimately failed to coax a single word out of him, so I did what I felt was the next most logical step and decided to call for help. I dialed 911 and made a point of putting the call on speaker, hoping that hearing another voice would have somehow snapped my husband out of his trance, perhaps made him realize how seriously I was taking this. That was the single biggest mistake of my life. Instead of the familiar ringing tone, there was a high-pitched electronic shriek. The closest thing I compared to it would be a coil whine, only amplified to an ear-popping squealing that kept increasing in volume. I felt as if my brain was boiling in its own juices, unable to process all the sequences and patterns being force-fed to me by the signal. Worst of all, some of the frequencies began taking shape in my head, forming into strands of alien code, but... If they were so foreign, then why did I recognize some of them? How could I possibly have known that two perpendicular lines in a semicircle are all that it takes to summarize our entire existence? Our biology, our history, our achievements and purpose, our birth and inevitable extermination. Me and you. Only you are not you. Rather, you aren't meant to be you. Even the concept of you is just a symptom of a greater misconception. I'm you just as much as you are you, which consequently means that you are me. But if I'm you and you are me, then who or what are we? In a desperate act of preserving what little remained of my sanity, I threw my phone to the floor and proceeded to stomp over it until the signal was no more. Its cracked screen flickered beneath the impact of my heel, and its artificial life got snuffed out in an instant. Drenched in near-perfect darkness yet again, I cupped both sides of my pulsating skull and slumped against the wall closest to me. A picture frame fell off its perch and shattered against the tiles, a symbolic representation of the fracturing of my own psyche. Warm tears streamed down my cheeks, only they weren't tears at all, they were vicious more congealed and tasted of copper. Blood. My husband wasn't by my side anymore. Of course he wasn't. He was upstairs, looking for the gun his dad had given us before we moved. I always hated that thing. It was probably taking him a while to remember in which cupboard I'd stuffed it, then an additional couple of seconds of fumbling with the safety, and then... And then it was over. 
I barely registered the bang over the residual buzzing in my ears. Not that I needed to. The image of him laying face down with a leaking hole in his head was being projected against the back of my high lids. I was meant to see it. To see him lifelessly sprawled in the middle of our own bedroom, gray matter splattered against the tacky wallpaper and blood seeping between the floorboards. The empty husk of a man that had glimpsed the primordial truth and sought to escape it. And though I wanted to, I couldn't blame him for it. I inspected my own hands through red tinted lenses. They were our hands now, down to the last blemish line and wrinkle. I placed them over the writhing growth inside my stomach. It settled down. There was a heartbeat. Loud. Rhythmic and clear. It told me what I needed to do. There was no running from it anymore. Each step felt more cumbersome than the last, or was it my consciousness weighing me down? The floor no longer felt solid. Instead, it melted and warped beneath me as if the house itself was trying to dissuade me from leaving. I yelled for it to let me go, and it flinched, but only for a moment before continuing to ensnare me in its muck of willful ignorance. Lauren. There was a dark mass crawling down the staircase behind me. A staircase that didn't belong there to begin with. It was bulbous, black, and covered in amorphous growths, some of which it used to pull itself toward me. Among its pustules and inky tendrils, however, was a face. It wore a face that I had once loved, now stretched and twisted, contorted into grimaces that expressed an entire spectrum of conflicting emotions. Perhaps it didn't know what it was meant to feel, neither did I. But in the midst of the churning abyss, there remained one constant. A pair of blue eyes. I know none of this makes sense, but that's what tends to happen when you break reality. We, this version of us, were never meant to peer past the one-way mirror. That's where they live. They thrive between the material and immaterial, fulfilling their role as unbiased observers until the experiment that is humanity reaches its final stage. The three of us had inadvertently breached the protocol and were thus deemed compromised and contaminated. And then again, maybe we were meant to go off script and it was all just a test to see how we would react when exposed to the void that our species had once been a part of. Daniel denied it. It was of no further use to them, but me and Max, my precious baby boy, faced it head on and survived. What happened next remains a blur. I remember how cold the doorknob felt in my hand. I remember a blinding, all-encompassing radiance and an alternating number of silhouettes standing in front of it. Whenever I close my eyes and attempt to picture them, they appear to me as both one entity and an entire hive, as if individuality as a concept doesn't apply to them. Isolating a single one of their features is impossible, as they simultaneously possess every trait and existence, and none at all. Compared to you and me, they are alien in the truest, most literal sense of the word. Our neighbors found me the following morning while shoveling snow off their porch. I'd been sitting in the middle of the sidewalk, muttering nonsense and refusing to acknowledge anyone or anything. Once the remains of my husband were also discovered, it became apparent that I'd suffered from a mental breakdown as a result of his spontaneous suicide. Though I had to part with a few of my frostbitten toes, I eventually recovered. I even managed to safely deliver Max just a month later. As expected, nobody believes my recollection of what actually happened, and I've spent the last decade of my life trying to forget it myself. So why bring it up now? 
as of today, it has been exactly 10 years since Dan left us. The lights in my new apartment have been flickering for the past few hours, and I'm scared to use my phone. I won't let them have our son, too. I'm not just some crazy girl. You'll believe me if you just take a moment and see the leech the way I saw it. I know you will. Just listen. It started when I was in Japan. I'd been living with a host family for a few months and my semester abroad was almost over. I had the nerve to believe I'd begun to acclimate, that I understood their culture and could call myself one of them. On more than a few nights gathered around the fire, they told me their superstitions and scary stories. Their myths were very different from the ones I'd grown up with, and I found them fascinating, but not scary. They were too different. There was a heavy emphasis on choice. Rather than facing a mindless slasher that simply wanted to kill you, many Japanese horror stories involved entities approaching an unwary victim in a public place and giving them a choice. If the victim answered one way, they would be killed horribly in a specific manner. If the victim took the other choice, they would be killed horribly in another specific manner. These unwinnable situations made me laugh until the father of my host family explained to me in quiet tones the true subtext. It was all about the third option. It was all about the innate fear of customs in a very traditional society. The only way to survive was to simply know the acceptable third answer and give that one instead. He squeezed my arm and told me that I, as a foreigner, stood no chance of knowing the third answer. If I saw someone approaching me in public, no matter how innocent it seemed, I was to run away before they could speak and give me that fatal choice. I smiled and laughed it off, but his warning made me shiver a few times over my last few days. As a girl alone in another country, I was already on guard while walking through public spaces, but the towering maze of Tokyo took on a gray and tense tone whenever I thought of what might lurk among the crowds. I stuck to the paths that went through the many hidden gardens and parks, and I always looked around warily. That fear faded, though. I can't tell you why, not exactly. I was young. I thought I was smart, and I was American. Nothing could really hurt me. And besides, I was one of them now, right? I had spent months there, living like they did. So on my last day, when a woman began walking intently toward me from the opposite end of a long subway car, I stayed in my seat. She had long black hair, beautiful dark eyes, and a dark green dress that seemed out of place in a crowded car, otherwise filled with gray shirts, dark suits, and white blouses. I saw these details about her before. I saw the deep scars on her face and hands, as if a maniacal American slasher had brutally carved her up and left her to die some years ago. As she shuffled toward me, the lights flickered once. The boy in the seat next to me shivered and focused worriedly on his portable game. Adults looked away, tense, and teenagers opposite me finally stopped talking and began staring at their shoes. They knew. They knew, and there was nothing any of them could or would do for me. I was a foreigner, and a stranger to them. But they listened. <laughs> oh, did they listen. 
I could almost hear them straining their ears to hear the whispers over the keening wheels on rails beneath us. Every small step the woman took seemed louder than the one before. Even then, I didn't believe it. I thought it was a prank, or someone just being strange. I thought the others in the car with me were turning away out of courtesy or disgust at her scars. When I saw a tear fall from the cheek to the boy next to me, when I saw it splatter onto his game screen while he continued to pretend to play, that was when I understood. She stood directly above me, and I raised my eyes to meet hers. Her scars crinkled horribly as she gave me a seemingly innocent smile, and she asked in a pleasant but whispery voice, Do you have a sister? I froze. If I said yes, what would happen? If I said no, what else would happen? When the lights flickered again and her face moved without moving right down close to mine, I almost panicked and told her the truth. Inches away from me, her smile widened. She turned her head slowly, horribly slowly, until her neck reached a 90 degree angle. On the verge of passing out from fright, I forced myself to start breathing again. Her smile turned into an angry frown. I cowered back against the person behind me who shrieked. The scarred woman in green began to reach for me, but car came to a smooth stop. The doors opened, and I dodged around her and ran out with the crowd. To their credits, none screamed. They simply hurried off to their various destinations while attempting to seem like nothing was wrong. Nobody wanted to draw attention to themselves. Nobody wanted to get noticed by the woman in green or by a polite society. I ran all the way to my host family's house, but nobody was home. It was my last day, and we'd already said our goodbyes, but it still felt odd that they were gone. Still trembling, I took a taxi to the airport, made my flight, and tried to rationalize the encounter away. The only hint I had that it ever even happened was a small cut on my upper arm where she nearly grabs me with her horribly long nails. A cut that had already strangely begun to heal into a scar. Hours into my international flight, I finally began to calm down, and I even started feeling a bit smug. Not only had I survived an encounter with a Japanese horror entity, I'd even managed to immediately take a flight straight the hell out of the entire country. I would not end up as another unwitting cautionary tale. I was A born and bred American girl that had seen every horror movie under the sun, and I'd made all the right decisions. Awesome. I told the story to a guy sitting next to me on my flight, and he asked, What if she shows up here on the plane? Where will you run? Yeah. I shut up right about then, and stayed tense for the next few hours. Eventually, though, I realized I'd be doomed no matter what if the woman in the green dress showed up here, so I finally gave in and slept. Awake or asleep didn't matter. My neighboring guy woke me up before we landed, joked that he'd kept guard, and reported that nobody had come for me while I'd been out. Half-heartedly thanking him, I made polite conversation, left the plane, got my stuff, and met my parents outside the airport. It was bright, sunny, and open here, and it was a relief to be back home. This was the land of simple horrors, of gory violence, zombies, and haunted locations. The scarred woman in the green dress would have no power here, if indeed she'd existed at all. I was talkative and happy on the ride home, and my parents were glad to see me. I didn't tell them about my horrible encounter because it honestly slipped from my mind. Everything was good. I was safe. We pulled up to the house where I'd grown up, and it looked exactly like I'd remembered. 
Only a few months had gone by, true, but it felt like a lifetime. Lodging in my stuff alongside my dad, I began to recount some funny memory that had come to mind. When he entered the front door, I turned toward the kitchen and saw her standing there. Green dress, scars, smile and all, the woman from the subway car thousands of miles distant stood waiting for me in my childhood home. She gave that same eerie smile and lifted a large knife. I screamed and dropped my bag, startled my father, dropped his too, and my mother rushed in from outside. The woman in green brought the knife down. She raised it and then brought it down again, chopping vegetables. Mistaking my reaction, my mother began screaming with me, but happily, and she pulled me forward. It's good to see your sister again, isn't it? Suddenly, I was forced into a hug with both my mom and the woman in green, but... Instead of trying to hurt me, the horrible stranger just smiled. It's good to see you, sis. I pulled away, trembling forcefully. I immediately sensed that that something was off, and I'd seen enough movies to know how to keep my cards close to my chest. Mom, what is going on? What do you mean, honey? She asked, smiling happily at both of us before moving deeper into the kitchen to help cook. The scarred woman in green kept her gaze and neutral smile fixated on me as I moved away from her, around the kitchen island and toward my mom. Why is she here? Who? Her. I returned the woman's stare. My mother laughed. <laughs> You've been away too long, dear. You remember that your sister's graduated and back from college now? I gulped. Humor me, Mom. Why doesn't she look like us? My father came down the stairs, returning from dropping off my bags, and gave me a black look. I thought we were past this. It's not nice to keep harping on your sister for being adopted. Horrified, I took a step back and bumped into the fridge. But... How? Oh. I guess I'm just super jet-lagged. Sorry, I was just trying to remember when that was. For a... Birthday present for her and all. My father sighed. Same day you were born. He stepped out to get more bags from the car. I turned away, mortified. My sister never took her gaze off me, almost taunting me with her expressionless invasion. As we both stood there, facing off silently, she lifted her knife and brought it down on her own arm, right along one of her scars. She didn't flinch. Instead, I did. Gripping my arm and looking down, I saw the skin slice, open, bleed, heal, and fade into a scar in moments. Aghast, I looked at her and saw the equivalent cut disappearing from her arm. Her smile grew a little wider. I opened my mouth to scream something with fury, but the scarred woman lifted a knife and pointed it at my mother's back. The implication was clear. The best I could do was to take the knife from her by offering to cook and insisting that my sister sit down at the table and relax. She did so, apparently willing to play a social game of cat and mouse. As I chopped up vegetables and stared at the scar on my arm, my thoughts raced. This entity had somehow attached itself to my life. Looking around at pictures in the kitchen, I saw her in photographs that I recognized. Family photos that now included her as a child, as a teenager, as a woman, scarred 
from the outset. I kept my eyes on her as she sat at the table, and she stared right back at me the entire time. Her disfigured smile never once changed. We actually sat down and had dinner as a family. My parents didn't seem to notice that my sister never spoke unless directly addressed, and even then only with perfect politeness. She ate a little and kept her eyes always on me. Halfway through dinner, I got angry and slammed my fist on the table. She took her dinner knife and drew it across her cheek. I fought hard not to scream as I felt my face split open, bleed, and then heal. I already knew there would be a scar, but I excused myself to go to the bathroom and look for myself. Once there, it occurred to me that the leech, a leech on my life, time, and soul, seemed to be punishing me for rudeness. I remember saying to the mirror, All right, you bitch, I'll play your game. I just needed time to figure out. Another slice opened up near my ear, bled, and quickly healed over into a scar. She'd heard me from the dining room. Or... She could hear me no matter what. Walking carefully back to the dining room, I put on my best graces and sat with a smile. I couldn't think about the scars. Were they permanent? Would I live the rest of my life disfigured? Plastic surgery might fix a few, but if this kept going... No. I would just have to be polite and proper until I could figure out how to destroy her. I volunteered to help clean up dinner and do the dishes, and my mother seemed surprised, saying that my time in Japan had done me good. I didn't know what she meant by that, but I managed to get through the evening without any further scars. That night, I tried to whisper to my father in the dark, but he didn't understand what I meant, and I earned another scar on my arm. I slipped downstairs and into her room. My sister sat holding a knife to her arm and grinning wider than I'd ever seen. What do you want? I asked her. She held the knife higher on her arm, just above a clear patch of skin where her scars had left her and been transferred to me. Do you have a sister? Suddenly remembering that moment of mortal threat in the subway car, I, I said nothing. She did not cut herself, but she did wait, always staring, ever staring. I backed out went to my own bedroom where I lay stressed for hours. I did sleep eventually, but only because jet lag forced me into it. The next few days were filled with terribly costly chess moves. I invited over old friends to see if they recognized her as my sister. And they did. For each of these conversations with confused friends, I earned another scar. The leech knew what I was trying to do, and she disapproved. The worst part was running into an ex-boyfriend and finding out that he didn't remember our relationship. After much pressure, he finally admitted... I liked your personality, but I didn't ask you out. Because of your scars. Sorry. I remember screaming and earning another scar for it. Rushing home, I looked at my old yearbook pictures. The scars weren't just appearing now, they were appearing back then, too. I'd always had them. That same ex-boyfriend would later remember asking out my sister instead. The leech was draining away my life right before my eyes. What would happen when she ran out of scars and I had them all? I couldn't talk to my parents. I couldn't talk to my friends. I shut myself in my room and spent each day alone to avoid any further social improprieties. I've been raised American, raised rude, proud, and free, and I kept making mistakes. 
It was in me to swear, to nettle, to tease, and the cost was just too high. My host family's father had been right. I was losing because I was from the wrong culture. Had I been a traditional and proper Japanese girl, the leech might have never punished me even once. The leech existed to punish deviants. The leech fed off outsiders, rebels, and bad children. The leech... The leech was part of me now. She only had a few scars when the idea came to me. She had this huge, asinine grin all the time now, and she stood in my room while I slept, staring at me, basically daring me to say something rude. She held a knife over me while I slept, yes, but it was not to cut me. It was to cut herself. And that's what gave me the idea. Furious and desperate beyond description, I decided that I wanted my life back at any cost. I've been thinking of the leech in two ways. I could avoid being rude and live under her threat for the rest of my life, or I could be myself and find out what punishment awaited once all the scars had been inflicted upon me. I feared that second option. I was terrified. When the leech became clear and beautiful and I became horrid and misshapen, what would she do to me? Would she kill me? Discard me when I stopped being useful? Would I cease to exist altogether? Would my life completely become hers? I'd been so afraid of that second option. It took me until she only had one scar left to remember what my benefactor had said. There was a third option, one unknowable to any but the most socially integrated, and I had enough time to see that for the leech. The social game went both ways. We were not in Japan. We were in America. Here, victims got tough when the end was nigh. She was with me always then. She walked directly behind me, goading me, irritating me, pushing me with her silence and her grin. <laughs> that perfect smile on that beautiful face, it mocked me. I stood in the kitchen with her, and I drew out the same knife she'd been holding when I'd first come home, and found her attached to my life and timeline like the horrific leech that she was. I smiled at her, matching her expression, and I brought the knife down before she could react. Not on her. On myself. I slashed open my arm and blood splattered across the kitchen island. She gasped and pulled back, her hair hiding her face. I saw her clutch her arm and I saw a scar appear in the equivalent place where I'd slashed myself. I wasn't healing, but I'd actually managed to injure her. I thought long and hard about it. Cutting her would only mean cutting myself, but cutting myself meant cutting her. I slashed again, this time on my face. She screamed. Finally, God. I'd longed, prayed to hear that noise from her. I slashed again on my leg, and she fell to her knees. My blood splattered across her green dress, soiling it, and I slashed myself again and again and again. I felt faint, and still I cut myself, turning my arms, legs, face, and tummy into an oozing mince meat and gobs of flesh. With each strike, she screamed louder and crumpled further. I fell to my knees before her, a wall of pain and ebbing gore, and I smiled at her as her scream reached a crescendo that soared into nothingness. With a last gasp, she shrank and blackened until she became nothing more than a grasping little animal, an actual leech. Without a person to latch on to. She was nothing but a worm. With the last of my strength, I stood up and stomped her. It was over. I called 911 after that, of course. 
and equally as expected you think I'm crazy, but you have to listen. She was real, but she's gone now, and I'm not going to do this again. I killed her. I know I'll be scarred all over just like she was, but at least I'll get to live. I'll get to swear. I'll get to drink. I'll get to... <laughs> Remorse? For what? Why are you asking me that question? Find the guy on the plane. He'll tell you what I told him. There's no way he'd forget. <laughs> You're not hearing me. Find anyone who was on the subway that day in my car. They'll tell you. Why do you keep saying that? Stop asking me that question. She was a leech. She took everything that should have been mine. If she just never been adopted, it would have been my life. They would have been my friends, my boyfriends, my prom date. She was always there. Always in my goddamn house. Always so much better than me. Always mocking me with that beautiful face. I don't have a sister. <laughs>